Well, I'm sure you've been reading these past few days and, uh, well, probably even feeling it in your bones. Uh, this is now a year since the lockdown, since the onslaught of COVID. And I'm sure we're feeling it. We have been feeling it. We can feel like, well, a situation as in the first reading, like we're in exile or not in our usual place. And, and you know, it's external thing, but we can also feel more and more our own vulnerability, our own sinfulness, if you want to call it that. The, the virus brings out, in many ways, the best in us, and the frontline workers, etc. But, you know, even just stuck at home with the same people or whatever, we can get angry and irritable and who knows what else. So COVID also makes us more susceptible to our, well, our own, our own susceptibilities, uh, our own human nature. So we can feel, we can feel the, the fragility, the negativity, the dangers of just being human more now than before. And we can maybe identify with the exile that's described in the first reading, the Babylonian exile. Uh, and also in the psalm, this famous psalm, uh, psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, when we remembered the way it could be and should be and the way it was and the way it maybe hopefully will be again. And as you notice, the end of the first reading brings that, it's the end of the book of Chronicles, it brings that, that special hope uh, that can return to Jerusalem, return to uh, a better life. Hmm? And today, Leitare Sunday, if we rejoice, well, then hopefully we have something to rejoice about. And the second reading reminds us of just how much we do have to be grateful for. And in fact, it's, it's maybe when we're most aware of the abyss, you know, of, of the dark place that we are, are brought out of, we can better appreciate, you know, the light and the life that is given to us. And that's what's expressed in this magnificent uh, uh, second chapter of Ephesians than we have in the second reading. Uh, the more I read Ephesians over the years, the more I'm uh, just amazed at how magnificent and st stupendously profound each, each phrase of the whole letter is. Um, uh, so let's look, you know, and we'll see. This is what we are given, you know, how what we do have to rejoice about in our human condition such as it is. So God who is rich in mercy, all right, that's, that's the first thing and that's the best thing. God is rich in mercy. So we have to stop thinking about God as, you know, stern and judgmental and keeping track of everything and, you know, punishing, uh, because that's, that's a projection of our fears. In scripture it is too, a lot of the times, because that's not who God is. Dives in misericordia, rich in mercy, is actually the name of a recent papal encyclical. So luckily, the recent teaching of the church has been Francis, whose anniversary is today, by the way, the eighth anniversary of his election uh, as Pope, uh, have been reminding us more and more, rightly so, of, of God's mercy and how rich he, God is in mercy. Because of the great love that he has for us, not just love, great love, even when we were dead, so we were feeling dead, morally, socially, whatever way, dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. Now here, the author of the letter, as frequently seen in, in this letter, he, he, he creates neologisms, he makes, he's making up words. So, sunazoi uh, poisen, which means, it's one word, and it means co-vivified. He co-vivified us with Christ. He brought us to life with Christ. So that's not for later. This is already a reality that we can and should plunge into and experience and rejoice over, that we're already alive in Christ. He made us alive with Christ. We're already risen with Christ. It's not for after we die only. It starts now. And then, then he, he, he's so overwhelmed and excited by this, he doesn't just leave it at that. He says, uh, raised us up with him, Sunegeren, again, he makes up his own word, he co-raised us, and then, even more astonishing, he co-seated us 
again, a new word, he co-seated us with him in the heavens. So not only are we already risen, we're already ascended. Uh, do you know that? Are, you, are, you, are we aware of that? That we're already ascended with Christ? We should be able to plug into that, experience that, delve in, dive into that uh, in our uh, prayer and in our, uh, well, in our spiritual lives to experience that we are already raised with Christ, already seated with him in the heavens, that is to say a higher level of consciousness and awareness and life that is already ours. So no matter what valley we find ourselves in, we are also simultaneously on the heights because of what the Lord has given us in Christ. By grace we have been saved. This is repeated, so it's said twice here. Paul wants to bring, or the author wants to bring us home, bring it home to us. This is all God's mercy, which is great news. We don't have to merit it. It's grace. It's God's gift. It's, who's rich in mercy. So instead of being afraid, uh-oh, am I going to get this grace? No, you've already gotten it. You're already made alive and raised and seated in the heavens with Christ. So rejoice that it's such a gift. That's what grace means. It's a gift. It's God's gift, and that's who God is, who is, by essence, rich in mercy. So that he may show the immeasurable riches, inestimable riches, incalculable riches. So it's not just riches. It's incalculable riches of his grace in his kindness and goodness to us in Christ. I mean, Paul, the author is just rolling over his, himself, you know, trying to find words that are adequate to this wondrous mystery. Then again, he repeats, by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is not a subscription to a set of beliefs. Faith is a gift of yourself, an entrusting of yourself to a power higher than yourself, which luckily for us turns out to be a benevolent power, rich in mercy with inestimable riches of grace that he pours out upon us. So faith, we entrust ourselves to that. And this is not from you, he says. It's the gift of God. Well, exactly. So we didn't do anything to merit it. We can't anyway, so great. It's a gift of God. It is not from works. He wants to drive that home. So good works, they'll flow organically and spontaneously from your renewed vivification in Christ. Don't try and do it beforehand because it won't get you anywhere. So no one may boast, and that's the big danger. Oh, look at me. I'm holy. I did this good thing, and I did that good thing. Wow, good, great for me. Well, until your ego gets out of the way, it's not a good thing especially because you're going to probably look down on everybody else, and I'm better than everybody else, I'm pious, I'm Catholic, or whatever. It's just stupidity and nonsense. Let it go. It's all a gift. And then this magnificent phrase, we are his handiwork. The word in Greek is poema. Poem. That's what the word poem means. Look it up. The word poem in Greek means, uh, in, in English, means uh, something we make, we do, but the word originally means something done. We're his handiwork, we're his poema, we're his poem, we're God's poetry. We're God's poetry. He wrote us, he's writing us, he raised us up, he gives us life, inestimable and calculable riches of grace. He's writing a poem with our lives, so get out of the way. Don't try to write it yourself. Let God do it. It'll be much more beautiful, and you'll like it a lot more, and you'll enjoy it a lot more. It's you, your own life. Created in Christ Jesus, so we're, we're his creation, nothing from us, for the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to live in them. So even the works that we do, I say spontaneously, are prepared in advance by God's grace and by God's life in us. It's not from us. Fantastic! You know, all we got to do is let God in and let God work through and let God vivify us and raise us up and fill us with his love and joy and peace. Hmm? Well, that's the good news then in the midst of our exile, in the midst of our depressions and darkness, that there is that light. And that's the light uh, that we speak about in the gospel. So the gospel shows us how this works. How does... How does God bring us this? He brings it in Christ, as we've heard. 
But this is how. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, you might be able to find some representations of this online, but you'll never see it in a church. I guarantee you'll never see it in a church where Jesus is the snake on the tree. But that's what he's comparing it to here. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And what that means is Christ has taken on our full humanity, even the serpent, which is that humanity within us uh, that can lead us into trouble. Here he's taking that on and becoming that. That's what the incarnation is. That's what the passion is. He's taking on our full humanity, taking on the darkness himself. So God is not just, you know, saying, giving us grace from on high. He's giving us grace through Christ who's taking, going down into the valley, into the dark abyss with us and raising us up from there. He's joining us there. It's not just some abracadabra from on high. He's coming down, so to speak, and living our human life, taking on our human weakness, our sin, our suffering, all of that from within and transforming that. So that's where Jesus meets us, right there where we are. And that's from, from that place that we are raised up and vivified and raised up to the heavens. So that's how it works. God coming into the world, which is this famous line, God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes, has that faith, uh, might not perish but have eternal life, vivified, co-vivified with Christ. And just to reassure us again who God really is, God didn't send his son to condemn the world or to judge the world. He came to save the world because God so loved the world. I hope we believe that. God loves the world. His attitude is not one of, I wish I didn't, hadn't done that. You know. No, he loves the world and gave his only son. And this is the verdict that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. Okay. Whoever does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. Why is that? Why are they afraid of having their works exposed? Well, maybe in some cases they actually like the evil things they're doing. Maybe that they're kind of that far gone for the moment anyway. But more often, I think they're afraid to come to the light because they're going to feel judged and therefore maybe punished, maybe thrown in jail. But that's because they haven't experienced or known who God really is yet. So you don't need to be afraid to come to the light, to see the mess you're in. Because you know who's down there with you in the mess? Jesus. That's what the cross is. He's right there with you in the mess. So don't be afraid to show the mess. That's where we all start. We didn't be afraid of that. And then the final caution, whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. Okay, be careful. You remember what we just saw in Ephesians. It's not that the person, I've lived a good light, life, I'm in the light, so I'm gonna come to the light and show, look, Look, I have great works that I've done. See, I'm great. I, I'm in the light. That's just the stupid ego again saying that I did this, where we just heard time and time again in the, that pat, in the letter to the Ephesians, it's not your doing. It's not by works. It's a gift of God. By grace you have been saved. I repeat, by grace you have been saved. It's nothing you've done on your own. So what's happening here? Well, the people are coming into the light to show that the light has been working in them. That's all. They believed in God and the light has worked through them, which is true then of us all. The works are done in God. The works, as we just heard, that he prepared in advance that we should walk in them. They're all from God, all by grace. So we have absolutely nothing to be afraid of and absolutely nothing to boast of. The ego is gone because we're now Christified, vivified and raised and brought into the heavens in and with Christ and transformed into Christ. So we don't need any ego to merit anything or to boast of anything anymore. Mm -hmm. So maybe make, a, make that our project for Lent and beyond to 
yeah, take full stock of where we find ourselves in the current situation, but take that precisely as a springboard for, okay, then let's experience how God is working in the midst of this, how God is meeting us where we are, how God is transforming us into Christ, how God is vivifying us in Christ, the God who is rich in mercy, uh, with incalculable wealth of grace, you know, in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm.